You're here? Yes. Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the sixth lecture in the numerical methods and computation course. So we are going to continue our discussion about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So this is the last thing that you are going to hear directly about it. And after that, we'll move on to the linear systems today. Okay? Uh, but before that, uh, one quick thing. So we have received some emails from you that you have problem with the scheduling about the lab, computer lab. And we are aware of that. We are in contact with people who are in charge of it. So hopefully we can kind of resolve the issue. I mean, a few of you have problems like being assigned, I mean, to two dates or just none of them, or you prefer one of the dates, something like that. Okay? We will fix it. Okay, so as a short recall, what we were talking about was this. We had a pendulum. So we know that from dynamics, we can come up with the equation of motion. And then here is the... Is here is the differential equation, the second order ODE, ordinary differential equation, that describes the variation of theta with time. As we said, when we have, a, we have an equation that describes the evolution of a system over time, then we call that equation a dynamical system. Then we said that, okay, if we have this general form of a dynamical system, which is the variation of y with respect to x equals to some general function f, of x and y, and for this we can find the state variables y e at which the system is in equilibrium. But we said that we can use what we have learned about the eigenvalues of the matrices in order to understand which of these equilibrium points are stable and which one are unstable. Okay. So, for instance, in this case, we want to show that if you have this this case, then we have stable equilibrium for the pendulum, but for this very idealistic case that we can kind of uh, hold the object or just leave it like this and this remains like this, it's unstable uh, equilibrium. But in order to attack the problem, we said that since the system is nonlinear, it means that the function on the right hand side of this ordinary differential equation can be nonlinear in terms of both x, which is the independent variable, in most of the cases is time, and y, which is in general a vector containing the, the state vector, uh, sorry, state variables. Then in this case we should make, I mean compute, calculate the derivative of f with respect to each of these state variables, y1 to yn, okay? Because we have this system of equation, this is our dynamical system. This is a system of equations. So we have equation for state variable 1, y1, for y2, and so on to yn. And each of these equations has its, its associated right-hand side function, which is this f1 to fn. Okay, we have a set of equations. So in the first step, we have to calculate this Jacobian matrix. And here is the definition of that. So we pick up the right-hand side of the first equation and we find the derivative of that with respect to the state variables, y1 to yn, and we put this on the first row, okay? Then we do the same thing and we take the derivative of the second right-hand side function and calculate the derivative of that with respect to y1 to yn and we put it on the second row and we continue that until fn, okay? So we will end up in general for but with this n by n Jacobian matrix. 
So we had a, linear, a system of n equations, and Jacobian matrix associated to that is n by n. Okay? And what we should do is that we should calculate the eigenvalues of this uh, Jacobian matrix, which is evaluated at the, this y h, which is the equilibrium state. So therefore, we have, I mean, in practice, we, have, we can calculate or compute the eigenvalues of this. And we said that, in general, these eigenvalues can be complex numbers. And if you look at the notes that we had from the previous session, we said that, OK, this is the real part that is important. And it shows if the amplitude of the solution is going to grow over time or decay. So if this real part, this lambda r, is positive, then we have a growth of that mode in time. And it is, if, if it is negative, then we are going to have the decay of that. Okay? So we are going to just explain it more in the sample. So now let's go back to the examples we have. Do you have any question up to this point? OK? OK, so remember, this is the equation that we had. So we have a second order ODE. We have one second order ODE. And as a first step, we have to write the set of equations associated to this. So we have second order, then we should bring, I mean, convert this into or rewrite this in form of two first order equations. OK? So it sh should be written as two first order ODEs. You always, you can do this always. So for this, we introduce a new variable, this eta here. And we say that the derivative of the theta with respect to time is equal to eta. OK? Then we plug this, if I call this equation 1, so we use this in 1, which means that, OK, you can rewrite this uh, second derivative of t with respect to time is d with respect to t of d theta dt, and this is d eta dt. This is by the definition that we have provided here. Okay. So then we get a new equation right, from 1, or just rewrite it in terms of eta. And this is exactly what we needed. Now, instead of this equation 1, which was a second order OD, we have two first order ODs here. All right? Perfect. And on the right hand side, we have our f functions f1 and f2. As we said, this can be a function of t and also eta and theta, which are, that these are our state variables. So these are equivalent to vector y that we had. So OK, this is y1, this is y2 in the general definition that we had in the previous slides. Is it blurry or? That's great. OK. So, do you have any question about this? How we rewrite this second order ODE to two first order? OK. Then you have this. So what you should do is to form the corresponding Jacobian matrix. And for this, we are following the definition. And we said that, OK, first right-hand side function, which in this case is this guy, is going to be, so we should find the derivative of that with respect to eta and theta because our y1 is eta and y2 is theta. And then we go to the second row and do this for the second function, which is in this case the right-hand side. This is f2. So the derivative of f1 with respect to eta is 0 because we do not have any eta. But if we take the derivative of this with respect to theta, then clearly it's minus g over l cosine of theta. And for f2, 
I mean, derivative of that with respect to eta, we have one, and since there is no theta, we get zero here, okay? Perfect, so we get what we wanted. So we have the Jacobian matrix, and the rest of it is what you have learned during this course, okay? So what I try to say through these practical examples is that we can have, I mean, different applications in engineering, in science, so after doing like a few operations, we will end up with these matrices where what we have learned in this course about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are directly applicable. So if you are going to be examined about this type of practical questions or examples, I mean, you are not supposed to do this kind of the dynamic part or get the equations or something like that, but you should be able to do the operations like rewriting it into the, into four, I mean, like the set of equations and they get the Jacobian matrix and find the eigenvalues. Something that you have learned in the course is going to be examined. Okay. So then, this is what we do. So if I rewrite the matrix, so this J is 0, 1, minus g over l cosine of theta, zero. So this is the definition of the eigenvalues. So we can find the eigenvalues. Okay? But you remember we have two equilibrium points. One was this. So this is associated to theta equals zero. Because theta was kind of measured from, from the vertical line. So if it was this, then theta was measured like this. So in this case is theta zero. And eta is in both cases is zero because we said that uh, we, we do not have any velocity. Because it's kind of, we assume that in this state, I mean, the, the pendulum is fixed, it's not moving. So we do not have any velocity. So this theta has to be zero. So we, we substitute this theta equals zero in this Jacobian matrix and calculate the eigenvalues. So in this case, you will end up with a pair of imaginary, purely imaginary eigenvalues. But if you consider this case, where theta is measured from here, so it's pi, as you see here, and again, the velocity is zero, so eta is zero, you get I mean, two real eigenvalues. Okay, so let's see what's happening. So these two guys, the pair, are going to be here. Oh, sorry. Okay, these are going to be purely imaginary. So we have to access the horizontal one is showing the real part of the eigenvalue, and the vertical one is the, is the imaginary part. So for this pair of purely imaginary, of course, we have the real part as zero. So we put them here. And for this, we are going to get pure oscilla uh, harmonic oscillations. And the, 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 the amplitude is fixed. Just it's like an uh, oscillation that we are going to have. So it means that, uh, that if we perturb the system from this state, okay, there won't be any change in the amplitude of the oscillation. But if you consider these real ones, because of having this, the, the, the one here, that is in the positive side of the real axis, we are going to get growth in any perturbation that we exert on the system. So this has actually very many applications in numerical analysis. If you write down an equation and you want to show it's numerically stable, then you use these eigenvalues. If you go, go to control theory, I mean the same. So what I try to say is that this, this type of analysis, is asymptotic stability analysis, has a lot of applications in various fields. So what you should do is just get the Jacobian matrix, find the eigenvalues, and see if you get any eigenvalue with positive real part. In that case, your system is not going to be stable for the given mode.
Was it clear? Do you have any question? Yes, please. Repeat what? Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, we said that we have this type of general solution, e to the power of the eigenvalue multiplied by time. So the solutions are in form of this exponential function. So this can be written as omega it. So this is omega rt plus e it. Sorry, multiplied, okay? And we know that this is like a harmonic oscillation. But this one is the amplitude. So if you have lambda R positive, time is positive always. So as the time passes, then your system may kind of, kind of the, the, the mode of, the amplitude of this mode is going to grow over time, which means that if the initial perturb so you, you, you have an initial perturbation, which is very small amplitude, this amplitude can be amplified, can grow over time, which means that your system is going to be out of the equilibrium state in this case. I mean, basically it means that if you have this, you have perturbation, so it will come back to the equilibrium position again. But for this one, with the smallest perturbation, because you get some uh, mode that, is, that makes the system unstable, it's going to be away from the equilibrium state. But since we have done this with Jacobian, and in Jacobian we have, we have to linearize the function f on the right-hand side. So this, this works based on the assumption that we have a linear system, which is not the case. We actually had a nonlinear system because it, we had, we had sine, of, uh, sine of theta, which is a nonlinear function of theta. That's why we call this asymptotic stability analysis. But, but it's not important for you. For you, I mean, the, the pickup message is that you should kind of be able to find the eigenvalues and associated eigenvectors where the matrices are being resulted from uh, different applications in engineering and science. And you're not supposed to do, do those things in the exam, so you'll be given the matrix. Okay. Any more question or comment? Yes, please. Wait, so for a rule of thumb, So we may have like two real eigenvalues with negative sign. So still stable. Okay, so but in this case, since we have one with positive real part, then that's enough to say we have like an unstable system. Or asymptotically unstable. Yeah? So it's just a kind of a special case that we get positive, negative, real eigenvalues. We may have both negative or we may have both positive. Okay, then there is another example in the, in the slides. So we have this uh, system, we have two weights. Okay, so we have these two weights and we have uh, three springs. So two of them have the spring constant of small k and the other one has capital K. And for this system, we can find out that the, for the steady state solution of the oscillator, we have this following matrix. Okay, as you see, the matrix is given. And it's a two by two matrix. So what you're supposed to do is that first find the eigenvalues of this system. So we have a two by two system, and we should have two eigenvalues. So we should find lambda one and lambda two. And then associated to each of these eigenvalues, we should find the eigenvector. 
And once we have found that, we should show if we can expand some, some given uh, vector, like this z, in terms of the eigenvector basis. OK, looking at the, the, the matrix, what type of matrix is it? This is definitely a square matrix. Exactly. So it's real symmetric, right? Because, because if you look at the, the, the off-diagonal elements, so yeah, but we had a theorem. Do you remember that I said that, okay, we have a matrix which has all the good things. So this is the one. It's real symmetric. Okay? So definitely we have eigenvalues which are real and also associated eigenvectors are linearly independent, meaning that they form a complete set for kind of expanding any, any vector in the, in the given space. So in this case, we have a 2D space, so any vector in the 2D space can be expanded in terms of the eigenvectors of this. If you look at, I mean, it was two, two lectures before, I guess. You can look at it. So we have a real symmetric matrix. So already we know that the eigenvectors are linearly independent and we have two eigenvalues. So for this, again, you should follow the definition of how we, I mean, the, the eigenvalues. So as you see here, I mean, probably you don't need to solve it, so you just bring this to the right-hand side and make it, and then take the square root of both sides, and then you will end up with these two, lambda 1 and lambda 2. So it's like algebra. I don't think that I need to go through it. Okay? And then, as usual, in order to find the eigenvectors, we plug each of these lambdas in the definition that we have, okay? Then we get the associated eigenvector. So for instance, in this case, I mean, we have two identical linear equations, which means that we have one equation and two unknowns, okay? So which means that we should assume something for one of these unknowns, and the other one is going to be obtained from the given equation. So for instance, I can give x1, 1, 1, 1 to be 1, and then x2, 1 becomes minus 1, because we know that the sum of these two has to be 0. And then we plug the other eigenvector, we end up with this equation. So again, here we have two identical equations, so we should assume something for one of these variables, this x1, one, x1, 2, and the other one is going to be equal to the same value, so 1, 1. So we have two eigenvectors, 1 minus 1 and 1, 1. So you can show that these two are orthogonal, and we know why, because as we said, we have a real symmetric matrix. We expected the eigenvalues of that system to be mutually orthogonal which means that every two eigenvalues, uh, eigenvectors that you pick up are going to be uh, orthogonal. But in this case, we only have two, so. So do you have any question about any of these steps? We, we had a couple of examples how to find the eigenvalue, eigenvectors. So you just plug the associated eigenvector, eigenvalue, then you should come up with a linear system to solve. And I mean, in cases like this, it's kind of a trivial solution. But if there is no kind of trivial solution, then you have to find the, the solution of a linear system of equation. And this is exactly the subject of uh, the, the, the topic that I'm going to start today. And we are going to have like three lectures about it. Yes, please. Yes. OK. So you mean how to solve the equations? That's fine. I can, I can write it down here.
So what we do is this. So for instance, we have this k over m minus k over m, and this is also repeated below. Okay? But if you write this down in terms of equations, then it is km x11 plus k over m x21 is 0. And the same line also gives us the same equation. So we have only one equation, but two unknowns. So if we simplify this, which means that we divide both sides by k over m, then we get x11 plus x21 equals 0. So again, one equation, two unknowns. So what should we do? So we take x11 to be 1, and then if I call this star, then plug this in star. So if this is 1, the other one has to be minus 1. Okay? Because we want this star to hold. Therefore, this x1 eigenvector is going to be 1 minus 1. Clear? I'll just put, put 10. Doesn't matter. I'll do, do whatever you want. Just always, I mean, the simplest thing that you can put, the nicest, simplest thing is 1. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't get your question. Okay. So whatever you put there, it doesn't matter. But you, that's why exactly that we were talking about like convention for normalizing the eigenvectors, which of course I didn't do it here. It's not normalized because the, then the norm of this is not really one. What's happening to that? Okay. Any more comment questions? Okay, if not, we are going to start a new lecture, a new topic. Ah, no, no, I forgot one thing. Yeah. So this is here. So because we are supposed to, to kind of show that this vector z that is given 5 minus 3 can be written in terms of, I mean, as a linear combination of these eigenvectors. Okay? Which means that there are c1 and c2 for which we can re I mean, write z in this form. So it's exactly this z left-hand side is a linear combination of these two vectors, x1 and x2. So our task here is to find c1 and c2. Of course, here we have two unknowns, and for that, for a unique solution, we need to have two equations. As you see here, we have the two equations. So it's just the first um, first element multiplied by c1, so it's 1c1, plus, again, 1 multiplied by c2, equals to the first row of the right-hand or left-hand side, in this case, 5. And again, for the second one, c1 minus 1, then c2 multiplied by 1 is equal to minus 3. So if you sum these two, these two, these two equations together, what, 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 what are you going to get? You are going to get... 2 multiplied by c2 equals to 2, because c1 minus c1 are going to cancel out. And then from there you can find the value of c2. And then when you have the value of c2, you can plug it in, in any of these two equations and get c1. Yes. Yes, please. So when we calculate the eigenvectors, the only thing about is that they have the same magnitude, but one of the sizes is yeah exactly yeah so it's all, exactly so that's why that we are saying that it's always good to apply the convention of having length or norm one or normalize the eigenvector okay that, that's actually a very good question yeah. also connected to the previous one so I didn't do it here but I mean to be safe it's always good to do it 
Any other question? Yeah. Exactly. This is, this is, this is like, yes, this is expansion, it's linear. You are expressing a given z in terms of these two vectors. And as you see, we have unique combi uh, values for c1 and c2, which means that for the given vectors z, I mean, we have a unique kind of decomposition of the vector in terms of the eigenvectors. And this is the good property of the matrix that we had, right? Because the matrix had mutually orthogonal eigenvectors. So they could form a complete set of vectors to span any vector, um, to span the 2D dimension, because it was two by two matrix. So as you see, I mean, we came up with this, that now we have to solve a linear equation. So I just explain how to solve this by just, this was a very nice case. So I could just sum these two equations together and get values of C1 and C2 directly. But this is exactly the motiva or one motivation to go through the linear systems of equations. As you see here, we have a linear, I mean, a set of a two, two equations, which are linear, okay, in terms of C1 and C2. It's a linear equation, and we want to know how to solve this. And we are not going to deal with such nice, nice cases always. It's just it's two by two. You can solve it very quickly. So you can have thousands of by thousands, I mean, thousands of equations. And then you should learn how to solve them. And that's exactly the topic of what we are going to start now. So before moving on to the next topic, is there any question, comment? Yes, please. How do I? This one? So is I guess oh, okay in the uploaded handwritten notes in the last meeting or lecture, I, I wrote kind of a note, a box about the inner product. But it means that, okay, first, first of all, we should have the same size of these two vectors, which are going to be uh, a product here. Then what we do is that the first element of the two is going to be multiplied together plus the, second, or the product of the second elements of the two. So we have one minus one, we have one by one, so one multiplied by one plus minus one multiplied by one. Yes. So it's just the corresponding elements have to be multiplied together, and then we have to find the sum of that. Uh, please take a look at me at, uh, in, uh, on the notes that I uploaded last time. Yes? Further questions? Okay, excellent. Let's... Okay, so this is the new lecture. So, starting from today, we are going to talk about the methods by which we can solve the linear algebraic <coughs> systems. Which means that we have a system of linear equations, and we want to learn how we can solve them. Either just applying direct methods, for instance, finding some I mean, with the use of inverse matrices, or do iteration. This is exactly the approach that we do in practice when we use computers. So we start, when we say uh, iterative, it's, it's that we start from an initial guess, and we try to refine that initial guess so that it converges to the actual solution. Okay? And this is exactly, whenever we talk about iterative, it means that we are talking about numerical I mean, uh, numerical methods. So we are going to have three lectures. So the one today, we are going to start from the definitions, motivations, and uh, look at the Kramer's rule and also Gaussian elim elimination. Then we have next meeting, the next lecture. So we are going to talk more about the Gaussian elimination. Uh, then about the pivoting method, LU decomposition, and uh, direct method using matrix inversion. And in the end, we are going to look at uh, 
four iterative methods. And by that, we are going to conclude this topic. So it means that now we are starting, at least by the end of next week, we are in, uh, we, we cover these topics, these lectures. OK, as definition, so we know that, I mean, in just uh, four scalars, if we have this equation, a as a scalar, x scalar, b a scalar. If we have L, a multiplied by x equals b, and we know the value of a and also value of b, then if you want to find the value of x, what, what, what do you do? What you do is that you say x is equal to b, the right-hand side, which is the known side, divided by this coefficient a. And by this, you find the value of the unknown variable x. Okay, it's a very trivial thing. And this would work if you, are, you don't have a equals zero. Because if you have zero, then b is non-zero. Then a division of non-zero value by a zero value doesn't have a meaning. It's not defined. Okay? And that, that cannot happen, of course, because it means zero equals to non-zero value. I mean, from the beginning, it's wrong. So from this, we can say that, okay, this holds for scalars, but we can have this also for the vectors, for in, I mean, in, in, uh, matrices. So the first line here, a11 multiplied by x1 plus a12 x2 and to the n, and we have a right-hand side b1. So here we have n unknowns, x1, x2, to xn. And for each of these unknowns, you see that we have a multiplier or coefficient a. On the right-hand side, we have a known value, which is b1. And we can just repeat that and get more equations. In general, you can have m equations for these n unknown variables. And these are all linear because we, do not we, we always have x1, x2 until xn, and we do not have multiplication of x1 by x2, for instance, or we do not have x1 square or, or cube or something like that, or we do not have a sign of x1, which means that we have a linear system. Okay? So in these three lectures or four lectures, we are not going to talk about the nonlinear systems. We have linear systems, which means that all the equations in terms of the unknowns are linear. So the unknowns here are x1 to xn. As you see, they are multiplied by constant values, so we always have linear equations. So you have seen it correctly, because m in, in general is not equal to n. n is number of unknown, and m is number of equations. So clearly, if we have m less than n, which means that we have less number of equations than the unknowns, then what, what should we call this system? We call it underdetermined, which means that it's not kind of clear. We, we cannot obtain all, a, a unique solution for the all unknowns. But vice versa, if we have more equations than unknowns, so it's overdetermined. And this is not the case that we are going to deal with in this course. But in this course, in particular, we are going to focus on the case that m is equal to n, which means that we have n unknowns and we have, we have exactly the same number of equations to, to find those n unknowns, which means that we have m equals to n. As you see here, we have this n by n equations. So each row is like one equation one set of equation for this n unknowns. So do you agree with me that we can use what we have learned about the matrix forms in order to write this set of equations like this, what we have in the bottom? So the, first the coefficients of the first equations are going to be the first row of this matrix, as you see here. Okay? So this first row here is going to be here. And then we have a column vector of the unknowns. On the right-hand side, we have column vector of the right-hand side, b1 to bn. So this is the standard form of the 
linear systems. And usually we call this matrix, which has the which, which contains the coefficients as matrix A. Okay. And based on the assumption that we had that M and N are equal, we have this matrix to be, I mean, as a square matrix, N by N. So, do you have any question or comment up to this point? Because it's very important that we agree on the conventions and definitions. Okay, so by this, we have learned how to write uh, linear system in form of matrices and vectors. And don't forget that in this case, we have a matrix which is n by n, and then we have matrix, matrix multiplication, because vector is like a matrix itself. So this is n by n, this is n by 1, so multiplication of n by n matrix by, uh, by an n by 1 matrix is going to be n by 1, which is exactly equal to the right-hand side. So it's like always check the indices. This is the best way of understanding what's happening. So now the question is that, okay, do how we get these linear systems or what are the, I mean, the situation, situations that we, we, we end up with these type of equations? So as we said, we are talking about uh, numerical methods and computations. So in general, we have an engineering application or a physical system which is described by a mathematical equation. So this is just an example here, but as you saw in the first lecture that we can have equations uh, like na the Navier-Stokes equations, which are very complicated. Uh, there is no closed form solution for them, for, I mean, general case. Which means that we have to find the discrete form of these equations, and this is the task of the numerical analysis, to find this discrete system. And then, we should solve these discrete systems using computer. So if you want to get an example, I mean, this is like a body here. So it's like a smooth curve, which means that we have a, we have a continuous system. And it's the right-hand side of the equations. And we have some equation which we cannot solve analytically. And we want to solve it numerically. So we approximate that continuous system by a discrete one, which means that we just put some a finite set of points or nodes on the boundary and then approximate this kind of a smooth curve by these uh, piecewise linear functions. This is just one way of approximation. And then instead of finding the value of the solution of uh, the, I mean the, the, the solution at all points in the continuous setting, what we are going to do is that we get the approximate values of that quantity at a set of discrete values, at uh, discrete points, this y1 to yn. So what we have here is that we had a, we had a differential equation, we have, we have it discretized, then if you write down everything in the discrete form, you will end up with a li linear system. If you solve this linear system, then you can find out the, the value of the quantity of interest at this y1 to yn points. Okay? So definitely this linear algebra system or the problem is the core of many, many numerical analysis and computation problems. Problems. So we should really learn how to solve linear systems of equations because this is like the cornerstone for, for almost every computational algorithm. Good. So as you saw, I mean the outline, we have a number of approaches to solve these equations, these linear systems. And we are going to discuss several of them in this course. But the starting point is that this Kramer's or Kramer's rule. So here, I mean, this is the most basic approach. This is a direct approach. It doesn't have any iteration. So basically says that. Uh, basically says that if we have a, 
this system here. Okay, this is a linear system. So if you want, if you want to find the value of x i, which is the i th unknown, what you should do is that first you compute the determinants of the matrix of the coefficients here. Okay, you have learned how to do this. You have this square matrix that I call it capital A. Then you should find the determinant of that. So this is called D. Okay? D is nothing but the determinant of that matrix. But if you want, want to find the value of the ith unknown, what you do is that you replace the ith column of A by the right-hand side vector, and then you compute or calculate the, uh, the determinant of the resulting matrix. So in this case, this is the determinant of A, but if you want to find the i-th root or the i-th unknown, so this guy here, the column here, which is the i-th column, is going to be replaced by the right-hand side vector, which is a column vector of size n, so it can be done easily. Just substitute this by b1 to bn, so you get a new matrix. And then you calculate the eigenvalue of the, sorry, the determinant of di. And uh, the value of xi, the ith unknown, is di divided by d. You remember that uh, when we were discussing the determinants, we said that the, complex, uh, the computational complexities of order and factorial. So we have to do two determinants. So in the standard way, we have two and factorial. But of course, I mean, these days are modified versions of this algorithm when, when it comes to the computation, to the computers and implementations, so to reduce the cost to n cube. And you know, this is like the scientific computing world. You will end up with a very nice mathematical approach, but it doesn't mean that it, it is the best one. Even it, if it gives you the most accurate values, maybe this is not the most efficient one in terms of the computational or the time or computational power. So what you should do, you try to optimize the algorithm and the way that you implement it I mean, when you write the computer code. Because it matters, because this solution of linear system that we saw, I mean, for instance, for an engineering application, is going to be repeated thousands of times when you run the simulation. So if you have improve, improvement of like one millisecond, it's going to matter in the end. Anyway, so is it clear what we do in this approach? Perfect. So, so I'm going to explain a few points about it. Yes? If the structure cuts out to 5 minutes in and there still isn't stuff mentioned, we can easily compensate for that using the lecture notes, right? I can, but I don't know if it's the best thing. <laughs> yeah, I can if you want, yes. We're talking about, we're talking about, wait, so this can be compensated with the lecture notes. Yes. Yeah. Great. But I guess I have checked. I mean, still, we, we have time, like 5 minutes or yes. 3, 4 minutes. Yeah, I mean, the recording will be fine. So, okay, we have this example, and after that, we can just... Okay, so as we said, this xi is going to be equal to di over d. So if d is not zero, which means that the coefficient matrix has a non-zero determinant, then everything is fine, because we are not going to end up with division by zero. But in case we have this determinant zero, we might be in trouble. Especially if we have d1, at least for one of the i's, the numerator is not zero. So then you will end up with the non-zero divided by zero. And this is not good. So in this case, we say, we say that the system is inconsistent and has no solution. So this approach is, I mean, it's not useful to Kramers. But if you have di equals zero, then it means that d0, di is 0 for all i, so it's 0 by 0. It's just not meaningful at all. 
And uh, again, the Kramer's rule is not applicable. So to see an example, we have this set of uh, two equations. We have two unknowns, x1 and x2. So first, we can rewrite this in form of a linear system, matrix form. So as I said, the first row is going to appear exactly on the first row. So 3 minus 5, and don't forget to put this x1, x2, I mean the column format. And the right-hand side, exactly the first row is minus 1. And you do the same for the second row. So minus two, one, one are the coefficients of multipliers. We put them in the coefficient matrix. And then right hand side minus four. So this is called A, this is X, and this is B. Which means that this is the general form of the linear system. Matrix A multiplied by vector X, which is the vector of unknowns, equals to the right hand side B, which is known. So as the first step, we have to find the determinant of A. So this D is the determinant of A. And we have learned how to do this. So you multiply the main diagonal elements and subtract from that the uh, multiplication of the off diagonal elements. So this becomes minus 7. If you want to find D, uh, X1, then you have to ca calculate D1. And in this case, the first the first column of A, because we are going to find X1, is going to replace by the right-hand side vector. This is exactly what we do. So the first column of A is replaced by the right-hand side vector, and after that, you should calculate the, uh, the determinant. And it's minus 21. For D2, okay, Exactly the same procedure. So we have x2, so now the second column of A is going to be replaced by the right-hand side vector. Which means that the first column is the same as what we had in A. And then you calculate the determinant. From this, you follow the definition. x1 is d1 over d, and x2 d2 over d. Then you get the values for x1 and x2. Okay? Perfect. So, do you have any question, comment? Otherwise, thank you for today and see you on Monday.